Hey everybody, it's Phil from OneWall Studio here again, this time bringing you another mix fix, which I haven't done for a very long time. So let's get this thing started. All right, first up in the mix fix, I'm going to show you as per the original, the original track that I was mixing, and then my finished product, which was approved by the client themselves. So let's give this a, a quick little listen of the different sections. So now that we've got a good idea of how the song feels, let me show you my mix of it. Same time. Ready? And opening. Now, just to give you a good feel for uh, the differences between the two, I'm going to alternate while discussing the differences. So here's the chorus again. As you can see, mine's extremely full range. And the original mix on this right side is extremely bright, but only really from like 2K up to maybe 10K with a massive cluster around 4K. Now, as you can tell, I like my mixes very warm with a lot less brightness. So mine sounds a little bit darker, a little bit more supported in the low end, whereas the original sounds a lot more uh, aggressive and uh, almost tinny, harsh in the upper range. But I'm going to show you how I accomplished this from the very beginning, starting with, as per the usual, the drums. So the original drums used on this track were actually a uh, counter kit, which I don't own. So I actually replaced them with another contact drum kit here called the Bo Birchall drums from Room Sound, because I'm a big fan of these drums. So I've loved Bo Birchall's drums ever since I listened to Senses Fail for the first time. And I will never forget that feeling of the, the kick and the snare just having like a massive boo boo and that could not be beat, especially at the time. So I'm going to start here at the drum bus and show you guys which drums I used. So first off, the kick was the Granville 18 by 22. Love that kick. The snare I chose was the Dark Beauty, which is six and a half by 14 inches. And then the rest of the toms are all the Granville. with the cymbals being the 16-inch China, the 19-inch Dark Crash, the 10-inch Splash, the 17-inch Dark Crash, and the 15-inch Hi-Hat. So with all of that in mind, I have it set to all zero presets so that I could route everything out to their individual channels here. And there's a ton of channels for the drum set. Out of all 45 tracks or so, that I have of the instrumental here, about 28 of them or 29 of them are dedicated to just the drums. So once the drums are set, that's gonna be our main squeeze here. Let's start here with the overheads. 
So first, you'll notice that I have an EQ, a compressor, and a limiter. Notice how uh, they make a huge difference. So first things first, let's show you the limiter. It's just set to uh, negative one dB as a threshold. Negative one dB is the ceiling, just to prevent it from peaking or going above the fader, because I like to more or less treat my faders as the ultimate volume. So more often than not, I like to get the signal to unity for the maximum peak or negative one for the maximum peak and then have the faders just so I can adjust them without too much uh, worry about the dynamics of the actual track itself. So that I keep on pretty much all the time on specifically the overheads. Then I also have this compressor. Absolutely slammed. It's a compressor and a limiter. But the main difference between this and the final sound for the overheads is the EQ. So I'm cutting a lot of the energy with a high pass below 400 hertz. A 6 dB cut at around 600 hertz. A 3 dB cut around 2 kilohertz and a 3 dB cut around 4.7 kilohertz with a slight shelf boost at 14 kilohertz just for some air. So you'll hear a major difference. With the EQ. Without the EQ. There was a lot of body in these overhead mics, so in order to get rid of some of that shell sound, I EQ'd a lot of that bottom end out. Because I like a tight controlled overhead. Same thing with this uh, compressor, really bringing up the overall volume. Treating it like a an optical compressor of a certain stripe with a 10 millisecond attack time, like a 400 millisecond recovery time, which is gonna be the release on this compressor. And then boosting it by about 10 dB to compensate for the loudest hits that trigger the limiter. Again, fast release time on the limiter and fast attack time on the limiter, just cause I want it to clamp down really quickly on massive explosive hits. So without, with. And that's definitely going to feed into the overall ambiance of the track. So from there, we have the shells bus, which contains the kick, the snare and the toms. And on the shells bus itself, I'm just doing one to three dB with a uh, Fairchild 670 style uh, Veramu with the time constant set to about three and never really going beyond three dB of gain reduction for the shells without with it just creates a feeling of a little bit more movement there so from that point on let's get into the kick so with the kick I have an EQ scooping out a lot of that low end and boosting a tiny bit of the sub frequency, just because there's already a lot of low end uh, and sub. I also wanted to boost a little bit of that knocking frequency here at around uh, 760 Hertz by only about two dB. It makes a slight difference. It's especially noticeable without it. So it just brings it up a little bit more in your face. Also have a cut at about 4K. Just because it had like a plasticky feel to me at that moment. So getting rid of that helped me to focus the kick a little bit more. And then I also have a boost at about 8K, only about 1 dB though. Just because it helped bring up that air a little bit, that, that really helped it stand out to me. After that, I have a compressor, which is complex by Kiev Audio. So for this, I'm mostly looking at doing a decent amount of compression. Anywhere between four and eight decibels at any given time. 
because while I like the tone of the kick, I do want it to have a little bit more push and pull because otherwise the sample feels a little bit more static. So I'm at two to one with a 60 millisecond release and a 25 millisecond attack. So after the initial transient, it clamps down and then releases fairly quickly. It also just beefs up the tone of the kick a little bit. Lots of little layers here. Up next, I have multi-transient by Audio Assault. So everything under 85-ish hertz is getting a slight boost to the attack. The sustain between 85 hertz and 1 kilohertz is being shortened just so that the, uh, the body doesn't ring out as much. And then I have a boost to the attack on 1K to 7.5K, and then everything above 7.5K is also getting boosted slightly. And the overall signal at the very end is also getting boosted. So what I did was I used a little bit more attack here on the global setting for the overall signal, and then gave a little bit less or a little bit more to the individual bands because I was happy with where this one was, the low mid band, with this amount of attack, after which I just boosted from there on the individual bands. So without these, without uh, any of the transient design, with just the global design, with a little bit of that bass design, with the high mids, and with the treble. So each step just adds a tiny little bit and brings up the overall flavor of the kick. Up last, I have JST Clip on it. You'll notice that the uh, volume level itself is about 2 dB higher than the fader, so there it's it would be clipping at Unity by about 2 dB. So I threw this clipper on and just have it clipping by about like 3 dB on the clipper to bring down the overall ceiling and make the low end a lot more consistent, as you can see here. While also bringing up that slight kick rattle that I like to feel in a mix. That goom, goom. Because with this, it's really nice and clicky, but with the clipper, it's got a punch and a knock to it. So without any of the processing, with. From there, let's take a look at the snare. So for the kick, the snare, and the toms, the processors themselves are all the same. I generally like to work with the same processors across the entire shell mix. So if I'm using the same compressor for the kick, I'll try to use it for the snare and the toms as well. Same goes for EQs, transient designers, and clippers. Anything I do on drums, I like to unify across the shells so that there's a little bit of consistency, as if you were mixing into a console and each channel was kind of like, you know, a console. Here's the EQ curve on the snare. Without that, you hear how it sounds a little bit uh, tinny in some areas, weak in others, and boxy in others. That's why I did so much EQ here to compensate. So I'm really just scooping it out and making the emphasis on the, uh, the air a little bit more. Now, if I were to invert these moves, you'd hear exactly what I was cutting and boosting. So much easier. <laughs> so you hear the frequencies I was getting rid of really well. And because of this, it sits in the mix a lot nicer. So up next, I have the same compressor as I had before for the kick. Doing about the same thing, but with a faster release this time. Ordinarily, for snare, I would have the release set to like maybe 100 milliseconds. However, I felt like it grabbed it too much in this track, and I really wanted it to breathe a little bit more. So I dragged the release all the way down to 25 milliseconds so that it has like a instead of like a grab your boom, boom, boom. I also have it set to a 20 to one ratio 
and I have the tone set to bring out the highs just a little bit more. So without the compressor, with. Really exciting the air there, just because I want that shell to really scream. Up next we have the transient designer, which has a little bit of boosting in the attack of the whole thing. But for the most part, the main moves that matter most are increasing the attack below 250 hertz, so that the fundamental of the snare can go a lot faster and a lot more aggressively. I'm also boosting the attack of the body ever so slightly, but dropping its sustain a lot in the low mids. So between 260 and 1.5k, the sustain of this boy is going to decrease. And here's why. Let me play for you the uh, sustain and crank it up to about as much as I cut it before. Hear how there's that like, that pingy resonance and also the bottom snare has like a crazy resonance to it? That There we go. It just helps hollow it out a little bit so that it doesn't take up too much space in the mix or rattle the whole time or ring the whole time, but still has that attack to it so that the snare really cuts. Also boosted the attack and sustain here on the high mids. And gave it a little bit of pump in the attack on the treble as well, which is everything over 6K. just to bring out the click of the stick against the uh, snare. So without any of the uh, transient design, lacks a little bit of excitement. With, it really makes the low end feel more like you're going boom, boom, and really smacking it harder. The attack, uh, even in little doses, makes a huge difference, and the sustain in the upper mids really gives that stick click a chance to shine. And then finally, I have the JST clip here at the end, clipping it by 6 dB to give it some real punch. Here how it really brings out the body, and especially that low-end pancakey smack of the, uh, the body. That's what I like to hear. So up next, let's do the toms. You'll notice that I've boosted a lot of the regions that I've cut in other uh, shells, and that's so that the toms can stand alone. If I flip the bands on the EQ here, you'll hear what I mean. I got rid of that resonance and that low mid thwack and boosted a lot of the click of the toms. So the toms also have a really heavy ratio here, like 20 to 1 and a really fast release as well, just like the snare, without the compressor. Transient design, I cut a lot of the sustain of the low end, because otherwise it was farting out a bit on the clipper. But boosting the attack gave it just a little punch without ringing out too much. To compensate, I boosted the sustain of the low mids so that the body could ring out more without the super low frequencies ringing out too much. Attack and sustain is also boosted across both of the high bands. So without any of the transient design, here's what it sounds like. It really just brings the toms forward and of course the clipper doing its job at like 60 BPM. It distorts the toms a little bit, but in context of the mix, the toms just kind of punch harder. So now, with all of that out of the way, let me go over what I did for the drum bus. I'm going to flip these bands so you can more easily hear what I was cutting. That 100 hertz farty sound, and that around 450 hertz kind of like... ringy wood sound. Got rid of that just to clean up the overall drums a bit. Hear how the drown drums sound a little bit more separate now? That's the intention. After that, I have Soothe. Listen to the Delta of Soothe. It's just getting rid of some of those clickier resonances and the cymbal wash up at around 5k.
without with it just recesses everything again makes it sound kind of uh more pleasant to my ears after that across the entire drum bus i have this quad compressor which actually makes a huge difference over 9.3k i have a 1 db uh shelf and below 100 hertz i have a 1 db shelf Everything below 100 hertz is only getting grabbed a little bit on the most aggressive low-end parts. Whereas everything in the middle bands between 100 hertz and 1K and between 1K and 9K, you've actually got some uh, multi-band compression going on that just ever so slightly sucks in the snare and the kick and the toms and all of that mid-rangey stuff that could otherwise get in the way of the guitars and the vocals and such. They still have all of their character to them, but they just get a little bit recessed so as to bring them in and have everything else fit better over top of them. Without the quad compressor, with It just brightens things up and like smooths it out a little bit. So after that, I have the 609 again. Using it as a real compressor, but not nearly as aggressive and only 1.5 to one ratio. Never doing more than like four dB of uh, gain reduction at the max. So I boosted it by four dB of gain. 100 millisecond recovery, 25 millisecond attack. I like to keep generally similar time scales for songs like this so that everything has a, like a very similar pump to it. Without the compressor. With. It just flattens out the performance a little bit, makes it more consistent and gives it more of like a push pull. After that, I have Keeve Tape Face. Never doing more than like 1 dB of gain reduction at a time. Ever so slightly saturated. Of course, it's at 30 ips, so it's not really getting rid of any high end. And with a slight saturation curve, it really just gives it some glue. And finally, I have Finality doing its limiter thing. Being a little bit more aggressive at 90 hertz of uh, sidechain. So only everything over 90 hertz is getting smacked. But you can really tell that it's going to town here. And that just catches the peaks and makes the drums as loud as they can be at given parts to make sure that they're punching the whole song. So let's turn off all of the processing thus far and then turn it all back on again. Oh yeah, that's smacking the way I want it to, so we should be good. Here we have the room tracks. Now the room tracks are really important for songs like this because they keep the the energy of the drums going and they keep like a, a comfortable space for you to hear everything in. And when there's a lot of uh, machine stuff going on, it's important to be able to hear that as being a little bit more lively, a little bit more real. The drum rooms do make and break the sound of everything else, because otherwise you've just got dry drums and they may sound good on their own, but they're going to need a space to operate in. So let's listen to how the rooms sound. Right off the bat, you'll notice that they're very mid-range heavy. So let me turn on this EQ. I did shelf the highs and the lows and boosted them both by about 2 to 3 dB. And then cut out some very specific resonances. 
So let me flip the bands and show you which resonances I cut. The problem with this kind, these frequencies is that they exist in everything else. So the rooms, just being here more or less for flavor, needed to be cold. To compensate for all this cutting, I did boost the uh, gain by about 12 dB at the end of the EQ because I did cut a lot. So without the EQ, with. After that, I used Soothe. Again, just getting rid of some of the clickier stuff and some of the more resonant parts of the cymbals. Without. With. So Soothe really does just make things feel like a little bit more recessed. I also literally copied and pasted the uh, quad compressor from their other drum bus onto here. But I made the ratios and the thresholds a lot more intense. So it's a lot grabbier. So that way you get the initial hit, but then it kind of sucks in the rest so that you don't get this really long, especially from the snare. Because otherwise it overtakes the tone of the, uh, the dry snare. From there, I literally copied and pasted what I had from the original drum bus, but actually just doubled the ratio to three to one and then set the attack time to fixed so that it's the fastest possible attack time. But otherwise, everything here is the same. It's just a little bit more. Because I love a pumpy drum bus, especially for rooms. Also copied and pasted the tape machine and then compensated for the gain reduction with just the adjustment of the input and output knobs. Still never really doing more than one dB of gain reduction, that really. And a little bit more saturated than the original. Also changed the ips to 15, so it cuts a little bit more of the highs. So now there's a roll off at like 16K, which I initially boosted with the quad compressor and it smooths out the whole thing. So now it's a more crushed drum bus. And finally, I'm using Finality, doing the same amount of damage as before, literally just copied and pasted the plug-in from the original bus. So now it pumps more. So let's A, B that. Notice how it brings out the overall push and pull of the room. It's a lot more ambient now. Now I'm gonna also solo the main drums. Let's mute the rooms. Very dry. Unmute the rooms. They make a big impact without getting in the way of the actual hits, which is really important. So up next I have the parallel bus for the drums, which is literally just gonna be Ascend from the kick and the snare and the toms. With these frequencies cut and boosted. So let me flip this to show you what I did. Got rid of the mushier frequencies and replaced them with some of the more hard hitting frequencies. Also gave it a little bit more mid range so that when the instruments actually hit, they hit with a lot more of a mid-focus punch. Also use this Distressor emulation from Keeve Audio. I like them. Very aggressive, got some warmth here, got some saturation. Really pushing it at 20 to one, just smashing the life out of these drums with an attack of four and a release of about 1.2 or so. Without that, it's just the dry drums. 
but with it's really smashed and distorted and punchy and of course finality is a limiter just to rein it in a little bit more so all in all that's the overall drum sound and everything else is bass and guitars So here we have Mayo Bass by Solemn Tones, which is doing the heavy lifting here of this track with literally just the Mayo Glass preset and then a little bit of tweaking to the mids, increased the output, and tamed the highs with a little bit more artificial attack under the enforced section. Here's what it sounds like without any processing. Sounds really freaking good by itself. However, I did just want to push up a little bit of that upper mid range to give it more of a Tesseracty knock. So I used Exciter by Audio Assault with a medium drive using power A on the high mids with a 28% drive and a 50 to 60% boost in the bass with about a 20% drive. Also using power C from Exciter 3. So here's what it does. The difference is a little subtle, but you'll definitely hear it in that upper mid-range. It just focuses the uh, upper mids between 800 hertz and 1.8k. The strings get hit, you get a little bit more of a jow jow jow. After that, I have an EQ here. Once again, focusing that mid-range. But cutting a little bit of 1.5k where the guitars were also strong. Just making room for the snare here at 200 hertz, making room for the vocals and guitars here at 500 hertz, making room for the guitars at 1.5k, making room for the guitars at 2.5k, and low passing it at about 5k. Without the EQ, with the EQ, you'll hear how it recesses a little bit and it's going to fit more into the overall profile of the mix, which is what we wanted to do, because this is really just to reinforce the guitars. On quad comp, I have a uh, multiband compressor once again, bringing down the lows for when they sustain too much. Notice how it's catching the bloom a little bit. And then just controlling that mid range so that it doesn't get too out of whack or out of shape. And also boosting the highs a little bit by about 1.2 dB. Without this, With. So while I don't necessarily think it makes the tone of the bass better, I do think it helps it sit more, especially tightening up that low end during sections where the low is a little bit too much. Speaking of, I have Track Spacer, Sidechain to the Kick. Everything under 129 hertz is being ducked by the kick at a one millisecond attack with a 20 millisecond release so that the entire kick transient can really get a hold of it. So it pumps the low end of the bass a little bit while the high end stays consistent. And to even that out more, I have this distressor with a super fast attack of zero and a release of about two, giving it that fast 1176 style uh, compression at a four to one ratio with a high pass engaged for the side chain, a warmth of about two and a half and a saturation of literally just under one. But this makes a pretty big difference when you're uh, listening to it in context. This helps to focus the bass immensely and keep it in pocket while also bringing out the, uh, the warmth of the strings. And finally, this limiter here, just bringing it up to the ceiling of negative 1.0 dB and never really doing more than 1 dB of gain reduction. Because without that limiter, it's still really dynamic in spite of all the compression. So I just did that to uh, ensure that it's much more protected.
Now, up next, I have this guitar tone, which without it, it's just a DI. Hey, so let's start from the beginning and build this. So initially, I just have TDR Nova here doing these little boosts at about 1K and about 5K so that it really focuses on that 1K area and that 5K area. So that there's those little peaks there so that when the strings hit, you get that jount, jount, gen energy, jount, jount that you want to hear from something so genty. So here it is without that. Here it is with. Hear how it focuses it a little bit, makes it sound more like down, 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 as opposed to na, 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 na. You get just a little bit of that and it should be enough. So up next, I have Amp Locker by Audio Assault. And here's the tone from the beginning. So first things first, I have Decomp set to a pretty decent sensitivity. Without it, the tone actually kind of is a little bit more inconsistent. So I have that there just to ensure a consistency of tone between the different sections. Up next, I also have Tube Screamer, which does what it does. A little bit of overdrive at 3.69. More tone at 6.11, so it's a little bit on the brighter side of the tone spectrum. And then boosting it into the amp at about 6.88. So here's what you'll hear without it. It's a little bit more breakup and a little bit less high gain. So the Tube Screamer just helps to increase the gain feel. I have it going into RVXX at a relatively low gain here of 4.62. High bass, cranked the mids a little bit more. The treble is pretty high, the presence is pretty high, the depth is pretty high, and the master is pretty high. So everything about this is a very breakup tone. Have that going into Glass Dunn. Uh, 4x12 uh, with an SM7B, slightly off axis of the cap. And then this side I have a Mesa 412 with a U87, also slightly off axis of the cap. These cabs make a huge difference if it was to be just the one. It would be too bright and crunchy. If it's this one, it feels too focused and too upper mid-rangey. So the combination of both of those helps a lot, in my opinion. Because it's the perfect sweet spot between the two mics. And then I just have this compressor, which isn't even really engaged right now, but I initially used it to control the output level a bit more. I also have this EQ which in context of the mix really needed to push the guitar tones a little bit more. So you may think I destroyed the tone, but without that, the guitar really has no space of its own without these uh, little boosts. Let me actually show you by flipping the bands what it sounds like without my EQing. Whistly and deep and nice, I'm sure, but it's lacking immensely in the mid range, so it does, it just disappears in the mix. Up next, I have Soothe, just ever so slightly fixing that 5K crackle and the stuff right around 2K. Just where these resonances were really fatiguing on me over time, especially during this chorus. Bypass. It feels too close to my ears. Unbypass, and it feels like it pulls back a little bit. Now keep in mind, this tone should not be too bassy because otherwise it's not supported by the bass at all. After that, I used Clarisonics, which is literally just boosting a little bit of that low end and bringing up the overall clarity of the guitars. So it's brightening it up a bit. Because now it's a very nice mid-rangey tone, but it was lacking a little bit in the high end.
Now, this would be a nightmare without Soothe because it's bringing up the uh, the brightness without bringing up the overall resonances. So let me see what would it sound like if it didn't have Soothe there before the Clarisonics. Oh, yeah. Sounds way too wiry. Nice. After that, I have Track Spacer set up to the snare. Only between 150 hertz and about 800 hertz. Attack of one millisecond, release of 10 milliseconds, so that when the snare hits, the mid-range of the guitars just ducks out of the way ever so slightly. You hear that? It just goes That way, the snare can punch through the mix consistently. After that, I have quad comp. Taming that low end again, boosting everything ever so slightly from like 350 hertz up to 6 kilohertz with a very tightly controlled 200 hertz up to about 350 hertz. However, I boosted this by 1 dB overall to focus it more, but also have it ducking by about 2 dB when it's too intense. So listen to how it affects the tone. And because the attack is set to about 50 milliseconds, you get the initial jaunt of the string hit, but then it cuts down on the sustain of the jaunt a bit. So it doesn't become fatiguing. After that, I pushed it into tape face because I love some tape saturation on everything. 15 ips, about 1 dB of gain reduction on the tape. 15 ips, saturation a little bit higher. And it should be solid. And then finally, I have finality. Limiting the heck out of that so that it's consistently the same volume level throughout the song and I can just automate with uh, automation. So let's listen to it in context. Notice it's very well supported by the bass, and that matters. So after the rhythm guitar bus, I have the radio bus. Literally, all I did, aside from automating that filter there, I loaded the one wall studio preset of uh, obligatory radio effects for amp locker, which already has a bunch of EQ built into it and some compression. Again, compressor, cranked tube screamer with a high tone. And then the EQ here, I have just carving out that low end even more so because the guitar tone also still had way too much low end. And it was sticking out too much during the breakdown. So I high passed it at like 340 hertz twice and cut the 600 hertz a bit, low passed it again, and that's literally all I did. So without the EQ, with, flip my bands, you hear that? Wow, wow. I didn't want it to sound like a duck, so I cut that. And that's the radio guitar effect, which in context, Cool. So after that, I have the lead guitar, which has ping pong pan on it, which is a fun word to say. Now, without all of these effects, it's a little bit different. So first thing I did was I pulled up Amp Locker and I set it to uh, one of my lead presets, which literally uses a presser pedal, 
tube screamer and I have the option for a hyperdrive here, the hyperdrive pedal, which is uh, like a boss SD one, but I didn't use the hyperdrive. I used the screamer and here's why. So this is with the screamer. This is with the hyperdrive. It may not sound that different, but it's in the sustain that it sounds a little bit too aggressive to me. I have the gain on this 50-50 AHM set to about 60%, bass is at about 60%, middle is at around 40%, treble is at like 70%, same with the presence, and the resonance is about 60%, and I've got a 414 on this HB412, again blended with this AC900, but with a uh, 421 that's way out here, so it's to be a lot warmer. And then a whole bunch of effects that are just part of the preset, really. So I turn off that delay, turn off that reverb, turn it on, just adds a little bit of excitement, turn off that EQ, just focus it a little bit more on the mid-range, and this compressor keeps the volume consistent. Everything that's fun happens after that. So I actually threw another delay on top of that using Valhalla delay. So there's a delay on top of a delay and it just gives it this really dark, deep feeling. 50% blend, eighth note on the left side, quarter note on the right, some ducking on the delay. So that when the uh, guitar is playing, the delay is like farther away. But when it's not as loud, the delays come up in volume towards you. So it feels like the delays are washing over you as the guitar goes away and vice versa. Very fun to do. Have this EQ making it feel super dark and dank and like far away. High pass up to like 300 hertz. Massive dip at 300. Only really letting like 5k through. This allows it to feel recessed and creepy without ever being too close to you. But that's also why after that I threw on Soothe, because if you notice Soothe is getting rid of some of that hairiness of the resonances around 5k. Helps it sit more. Have Clarisonics doing that boosty thing again. Bring up the sub a little bit, low focus and the clarity. Have the quad compressor just focusing the mid-range more and bringing it down, squashing it a little bit when it gets too much so that it can stay consistent there without blooming out a lot and stepping over any of the other instruments. Never really doing more than like one to two dB of gain reduction though. But that's all the way from like 350 Hertz up to like eight and a half K. But it is noticeable. Because it helps temper it a bit. After that, I have Track Spacer doing the same thing that it did on the rhythms side chain to the snare as well from one millisecond up to 35 milliseconds though so every time the snare hits it brings it down a lot more than it does for the uh, rhythms and because of how much delaying is going on there it means that it sounds like the snare really ducks almost all of the background stuff in the mix which gives the snare a massive powerful feeling of smacking everything I love it. Up next, I have the tape machine. More saturation than the others and a little bit of a low boost. And more distortion added. Just to give it some more grit, because I liked it. And finality. To limit it and bring it up in volume after all of those adjustments. That in context. without any of the effects added on the bus. It's dark and pretty, but this really brings it and makes it like something that sits above the mix, but also farther behind. It gives it dimension. So 
So it makes it more creepy and it fills out the mix a little more. After that, I have the strings bus, which is orchestral string companion. Let me show you what they sounded like by default. Nice and warm, mid rangey, really solid. However, they took up way too much space in the mix. So here's the EQ I used. Scooping out a lot of that while boosting the highs so that when it it doesn't compete too much. Quad comp bringing up the overall body of the strings while also boosting the air some more with a shelf. And it reintroducing some of that volume as well. Tape face bringing it in more with the same amount of saturation as I have on the lead so that it creates the feeling of that entire background pad. Both the lead guitar with that and the strings as if they're in the same space and on the same tape machine. The blend is really more interesting that way. Here it gives it both the same like distorted tape machine vibe. And finally, finality, bringing up the volume a lot. So that, in my opinion, makes it sound a lot cooler. I literally copied and pasted it to the ostinato part. So all of the processing is the same, right down to the EQ choices. The compression, but less body boosted just because I didn't need as much of that of the uh, more aggressive string part. Same tape distortion, same finality. And then finally I had Nasty Cello here which does some really cool stuff throughout the song, has that glitch pad on it. And the pitch shifter. This one I did high pass. Because there's a lot of low end there. And it gets in the way of the bass and the guitar and the drums. Like there's no way we could have fit that in the mix with as much low end stuff as going on in this track. So I focused in on the lows, bringing it down a bit, making it a little flatter cut out some of that mid-range that the guitar occupies, and then just boost it up here in like the 7K region. Because that's where they have the most space right now. 8K is pretty populated, 5K is pretty populated, 7K helps. I'll invert the band so you can hear what I'm getting rid of. All that mid-range. Mm. And I like that. Here's the quad compressor doing its thing. Bringing down the lows a little bit more. Boosting the highs a little bit more as if it's airy and spooky. Hear how it doesn't sound spooky? Now it sounds spooky. That's the intention. Same tape compressor I have on the others as well. Same level of saturation. Having that there gives it a distortion and an uneasiness that I like. And finality, bringing up the overall volume again. Here's the piano melody, which I'm not going to focus on because I mostly just have it like low in the mix for the vocal parts that are inevitably coming. And as far as the mix goes, that's entirely it. But here we come to the best part, in my humble opinion. Here we are at the mastering part. Now this part's gonna be probably the most fun for me, but let's just do one more ear refresher to compare and contrast where we're at versus the original master. So as you can see, my mix a lot more space and is a lot easier on the ears as of right now. The original, by comparison, is still pretty harsh, but 
I'm also going to fix up a couple of places uh, that can definitely use some fixing. So first things first, I still hear a little bit of harshness in my mix, so I'm just going to go out and uh, fix those. And I'm going to solo for you what has been adjusted. So first up is Chef's Omni Channel. I have the thump going on and off by about 2 dB, which just increases some of the low end. Focuses that low end a lot. I also have this de here. Getting rid of some of that, like, by anywhere from 3 to 6 dB when it's really aggressive. And a little bit more harshness at around 3.2 dB with a little bit wider of a Q. So this helps to clean it up a lot during these sections. Without that, in my opinion, it just feels a little bit too fluffy and a little bit too aggressive there when that happens. So up next, we have the EQ, which is a mid-side EQ. I'm boosting at around 10K with a pretty wide Q on this bell here. I'm also boosting the sides overall at about 1.3K by about 2 dB. The center, I'm not boosting at all there. At around 800 Hertz though in the center, I'm boosting by 2 dB. And boosting the sides at around 800 Hertz by about 1 dB. Again, just boosting the mids and sculpting a tight bit. I'm also cutting a really tight bit on the sides at around 300 so Hertz which is mostly all guitar right now on the sides, but occasionally I also felt like everything wolfed there a little bit too much in that wow. And I'm cutting in the lows of the really tight cue at around 150 hertz by about one and a half dB. Accumulation of all of those moves is Without them, and now with. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. All right, so after the EQ there, I have, you guessed it, Oak Sound Soothe, yay! So let's bypass that and unbypass that and see what you guys think. Now you may feel that it hits a little bit harder with Soothe disabled, but over time it very quickly becomes quite fatiguing having these uh, and that's all there ringing out. So this delta shows you what's getting removed. And it's not a lot, but I do like what it does. Up next, I have a match EQ profiled to Tesseract's Juno. Now that may sound weird because I've just altered the overall tonal profile of the track ever so slightly, but I haven't adjusted it by any more than about 2 dB in either direction. So there's just a slight bump between 600 Hertz to 1K, a little bit of 2-ish K pulled out, uh, a little bit of smoothing actually around uh, 4 to 7K, and then like a slight decrease at around uh, 250 hertz as well. So overall, there's not a lot actually being adjusted, but the tonal profile of it is so close to the uh, to Tesseract's Juno that I was like, you know, what, I'm going to use that as a reference here and just make some tweaks to get it close to that. With, with, without. With. So I just like the slight difference that it made. Up next, I have this Dynamics plugin here, which is a multiband compressor, which I have multiband comps all over this mix anyway, so there's no reason to be uh, stingy with them now. So this is doing a little bit all over the place. The lows, of course, having a slower attack means that if there's any sustained content here, 
it's going to clamp down a little bit more and the release being 30 milliseconds just means that it's going to give back when it's done a little bit faster. Same with this lower mids. So since I side chained a lot of things to the snare, when the snare hits, it's the primary thing going on in that area. Having this multiband compressor on the bus actually allows the compressor to sync that snare a little bit more into the mix so that it doesn't stand out too much, which with all that side chaining, it can, but it also has the benefit of gluing those things in. So even though they still duck and the snare is still pretty far out there, it also has the benefit of making the snare feel like it's more blended into everything, even though it still stands out and has a lot of clarity in this area. So you hear what I mean when I uh, solo this section. And without that, the snare really sticks out and ducks everything around it pretty well. But when I enable that, now it actually brings back some of that uh, guitar around it ever so slight. So it makes the snare feel like, okay, yes, everything's out of its way when it hits, but it's still part of the mix and it still uh, feels really nice. Like you're in a surrounded by guitar still around the snare, but it doesn't get in the way of the snare. However, if I didn't have all of that side chaining done on the snare, then having this multiband compressor in that low mid area, the guitars would trigger it more frequently than the snare would, or the guitars would be way too overpowering to the snare. Just how it works. It's a complicated puzzle of fun and love. So the upper mid range here is doing about the same thing. I have it clamping down a little bit more. So this is actually doing like two dB of gain reduction with only one dB of makeup gain. So that it can maintain some of that upper mid-range brightness, and especially in the darker moments, it's a little bit more bright than it would be otherwise. But when it's way too bright and everything's hitting at the same time, it just brings all that down so that it uh, blends better. So listen to the difference. Do you hear what I mean? It's really subtle, but it makes a huge difference to the movement of the track and the, the mix itself. And then I have the exact same thing happening with the 10K and above, where the really aggressive stuff, it clamps down on real quick after the initial transient, maybe even up to two dB, but I'm also boosting by one dB. So the parts that are less bright get more bright and then the parts that are more bright get a little bit less bright, which is really the point of a multiband compressor on the master is to just maintain a consistency in the band itself, which is really nice. So up next we have native bus compressor by SSL doing the most. Almost 4 dB of gain reduction on the master here. Attack time of 30 milliseconds, 0.1 second of release time, which is 100 milliseconds. Side chain high pass filter of 70 hertz and a ratio of 2 to 1. Initially, I had 1.5 and, and then tried 4, backed off to 2 because I liked the pump of it. So let's bypass that then. Unbypass. Notice how it glues everything together and makes the kick when it hits feel like boom, 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 as opposed to dun, 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 dun. It just felt too static to me still. So that's all that compressor's doing. Up next, I have, for anybody who's interested in uh, keeping their hearing, I'm going to try and level this out, but rip headphone users. K-Clip 3, set the threshold to negative 3 dB, which means that anything over negative 3 dB is going to get cut off. Uh, set it to crisp, which I'm pretty sure is just a hard clip. And then I'm boosting it by 2 dB on the input. So let's hear that. Never really clipping more than two and a half dB though. 
maybe three on the hardest hits. I just like what it does to drums, but that's my opinion. And then on to True Peak Limiter by Brainworks. So Plugin Alliance, love their stuff. I'm boosting the gain here by about 3.4 dB, setting the ceiling to negative one. It's True Peak Limited, so it's not going to go over that at all, which is ideal. Channel link is set to 0%, so left and right have some channel separation. And most importantly, I have the XL button set to 25% to bring back some of that intensity that might get lost by doing too much limiting. Never doing more than 1 to 3 dB of gain reduction. Here's the XL being clicked on and off. On. I'm not really sure what XL does, but I feel like it does some harmonic excitement, and I actually do like that. Your results may vary if you prefer not to have that on. You know, if you like it to be a little bit more of a flattened mix, that's fine. It's all opinion. And then I have Ozone 10 Maximizer, which is the only thing on the master bus that I really have automated. It's also set to true peak. I have a ceiling of negative 0.7 dB so that it never goes over that. Uh, the threshold's at around negative 2.6 pretty frequently. Uh, the transient set to 25 for the stereo independence. The sustain is also set to 100%, so they're not linked. So the stereo independence on the transients is a little bit uh, less independent than on the sustain stuff. So some of the washier things are more stereo independent, whereas the transient stuff is a little bit more centered. Uh, and the transient emphasis is set to like 18%, a little bit more soft clipping, medium soft clipping, not hard soft clipping or like light soft clipping, but still pretty rough irc2 which is just the mode that they have for limiting and then the thresholds at negative 2.6 for the majority of the time so we get a lot of volume out of this boy let me show you Now, a lot of the times I find that I need to turn the guitars down afterwards, but I usually focus on that if there's vocals. So in the meantime, I like the guitars loud. It's just my opinion. For these sections before the choruses drop, though, I do actually automate the uh, threshold back up to about zero dB so that it uh, increases the dynamic range of the track. It also has the benefit of bringing up our overall loudness to a really stupid high level. Uh, like without vocals, even it can sometimes drop down to like negative four dB RMS. So I'm probably going to back off on some of the limiting uh, in the final mix. But as it is right now, I really like how punchy it is. And let's compare it to the original. Notice again how high the uh, 4K and such is in the original, which I did a lot of work to tame in my mix. Also, the original peaks quite a bit, but only really goes up to like negative 9 dB RMS compared to a much more broad negative 6 dB RMS with a lot more low end. So comparing the two, mine's a lot flatter, original's a lot harsher up here, which, you know, it works to some extent. I would just tame it a lot more because there's a lot of elements here that have a lot of brightness. And if you can get rid of some of that, then it'll be a lot smoother. But you don't have to do all the work I did on the mastering aspect of it. I just wanted it to translate as well as I could to a whole bunch of different systems. And I wanted it to be loud because I really like loud. But 
that's all for today, guys. If you have any other things you want me to adjust in my own kind of way, like I mix music in a way that I like to listen to it. I like it to be relatively flat. I like it to have some uh, dirt, some character to it, a little bit more tape vibe. And I like things to be like some awkward combination of really clean and really dirty, if you know what I mean. But I'm Phil from Almost Studio. Please give me a like, a comment, or subscribe to my channel as I've got a lot more stuff coming in the future, uh, especially as I'm getting more into doing this YouTube thing. And uh, if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comment section below. Send me your mixes to aftercutrecords at gmail.com. That's A-F-T-E-R-C-U-T-R-E-C-O-R-D-S at gmail.com. And I will get back to you because I enjoy doing these mix fixes. And I always send it to the person first to make sure that they're okay with it. So if you don't like the mix or master that I do, if I did it in a way that you weren't pleased with or you thought could have been done better, let me know. I'll do a couple of revisions of it, and then I'll do a mix fix video based off of that. That's how this whole thing works. I've been Phil from One Wall Studio. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. In the meantime, have a good one. Bye-bye.